I mean, the steampunk production and all that, completely over the top, but as usual, I'm kind of down for it. Hey, I'm Alex Radcliffe from Board Game Co, and today I'm reviewing Skyrise from Roxley Games. Skyrise is a re-implementation of Metropolis. This Metropolis is an older game, came out quite some time ago, and Roxley Games is bringing the Roxley treatment to this game. Skyrise is an auction game. It's an auction game where you're going to be building out your buildings across the course of the city through a unique auction mechanism in which you're not actually outbidding on the thing that you want, you're outbidding on to something else. That will make sense. But you're trying to go ahead and place your buildings on the board using an auction mechanism across two phases, scoring at the end of each phase, and then scoring for how well you did across the course of play. So let's, let's show you how the auctions work, interrupt with scoring, and then go back to the rest of the game and cover it all. So. A typical turn in Skyrise goes like this. A player selects one of their buildings with a specific number on it. So you have the number on top of the buildings over here. You place that number, they place that building down with the number side face up in one of these central areas. So for example, I can go ahead and go over there. I am currently bidding on placement in that spot as well as the token in that spot. Now a player can outbid me with a higher building, but not where I went. You see, in Skyrise, you're going to be bidding on something different than what the player bid on. So if we go clockwise to my left, I can go ahead and grab my 74 to outbid that 64 over there, and I can place it down on any of the adjacent zones. So here, here, or here on the board. I am a particular fan of this spot over here. No particular reason, just because, and I'll bid there. Next, I can go ahead and bid. They're going to go ahead and they're going to let that bid stand. They're going to pass over here back to me and have to bid 81. I think I'm going to go ahead and pass, and we'll let this player take the building. He'll flip his building up, he claims the token, and then he goes ahead, we'll put the token over here, and then my building returns to me, and now it's his, his bid again. His bid again, he can again start from the central regions, but now this building's on the board, you can also start from wherever buildings already are. So now he can start in these adjust, adjust, additional zones at the same time, and he's going to go ahead and do so, starting with a nice little bid of, let's start with a 24. So we're going to go ahead and place a 24 down over here, bidding on that zone, that's not going to let that stand. So we're going to go ahead and grab a... 72 seems a bit too aggressive, but the truth is I do kind of like this zone, and I do want to disincentivize him from going, so I'm going to grab a 93, placing a white-on-white -white building there. That's a white token on a white spot. Very advantageous. We'll explain why soon. Back to him. I could bid a 94 to outbid him, but the spots I can go with a 94 are not particularly appealing, so much as it burns me up, I'm going to let him take that spot. So again, we're going to go ahead and give him the token. This token is going to slide over there. We're going to flip that building and return this building. Now that you know how the auctions work, let's go ahead and play this out. Why are you trying to gain locations on this board? How are you going to score points across the course of play? Well, first of all, round end is going to end when you run out of buildings from round one. Any buildings that have a little dot on them are round two buildings. You only have half your buildings at round one, and you don't have your wonder. So you're going to be spending your buildings, and as soon as a single player runs out of all their buildings, round one is over, you'll score for a few things, then you'll go to round two, then you'll score for everything. Round two, you're going to add your other buildings, they now enter play, you also have your wonder, we'll come back to that after. But as far as what you're trying to do and how you're trying to score in this game, everything scores points in different ways. Having locations on the board scores points. You score two points for every single location you currently have based on the current value of your starting values, which is two points. So every location, no matter the color, is worth two points. Off the bat, not bad. But you can see white over here grabbed a white district with a white token, and so by doing so, they now made all their white regions worth three points. Getting a color-on-color -color match can be very advantageous, and those are high spots to go after. The problem is you'll go to four points, then six points, then you'll go back down to four. So getting too many can be be a bad thing at the same time, although getting too many again is a good thing because every additional token is worth 8 points. You can shoot the moon getting too many, but too many might be a good thing. So you kind of want to get either the perfect number, getting 6 points per spot, which can be huge. If you have 7 white spots at the end of the game, 7 white locations, and you're getting 6 points for each one, that is a huge chunk of points in this game. Additionally, other tokens you'll see around are going to give you points in different ways. These A, B, C, and D tokens, they're each going to be a value of either 3, 4, 5, or 8, but we don't know which one. When this player over here took a B token, he gets to go ahead and look at B, and he sees that B is worth 4 points. It's not the, the prime spot to go for. It's not 3. 3 could be worse, but it could have been 5 or 8. So now they're going to go ahead and start running around for other tokens now that they have a bit more information. As soon as you gather a token of any of the numbers, you get to look at that token region. 
and you get to start planning around trying to get a whole bunch of tokens that are worth a bunch of points. We also have this wild token, which is, as you might imagine, counts for any of the regions you want. And then lastly, we have a few plus one tokens. Plus ones add additional value to any tokens you have over here, such as those tokens as well. Or if you're the first person to place down all your buildings, you get the 10 points for finishing all those. That'll be that. In between rounds, now you're only, going to, you're only going to score for that at the end of the game. You will not score for your building locations during the game. That's only end game scoring. The things you'll score, additional things you'll score at the end of the game, is over here, each player will be dealt one of these cards, which gives you a specific region color you're going for. So you're going for whites, you're going for yellows, you're going for whatever. And so you're going to be going ahead and getting 10 points if you score four or more in your preferred color. That's another end game scoring over here. And then mid game scoring is going to come from these over here, these scoring cards. We have the island control, which the person who has the tallest building on each of the four islands is going to be able to go ahead and score an extra five points per island they have the tallest building in. Over here we have bridges and windmills, and we have other scoring cards as well so just an example we have bridges and windmill the two active cars we'll score points for being on opposite sides of bridges if we can lock that in we'll get points for being on opposite sides of bridges over here over here 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 etc and then windmills once you have buildings next to windmill locations as well and so you have different scoring cards being mixed in that you'll score for doing the mid game and the end game as well and then finally you have your wonders your wonders over here are going to be worth points depending. You're going to start the game with three wonders, and you're going to have the opportunity when you enter the second age, you're going to pick one of your wonder cards to be the ability that you're using. You're going to play that, and that will both determine turn order for the second age, as well as what specific benefit you will get when you place down your wonder, which can be a big deal. These things can give you chunks of points, can give you additional options, can just give you tons of fun stuff that are very helpful. These wonders are very solid additions in terms of just giving you a variable gameplay as well as giving you something to vie for, something to do in the game. Now, it's worth noting, as far as player count, you're going to have a number of these regions based on the player count. So a two-player game will have two regions in the center, three-player game will have three, and a four-player game will have all four regions in the game. But that's basically what's going on here. You're going to go ahead and place your buildings, running auctions, trying to gather tokens that will help you score properly. You're going to be trying to go for clever plays where you'll get these little corners and manage to, to get a little spot where you can go ahead and win the spot, but then also go again and get another spot immediately after. Lots of clever opportunities for how the board builds and develops and how locations and neighborhoods start getting clogged up so that you can start getting everything you need over there. Lots of fun things happening in Skyrise. Let's talk about the game. So, first of all, everything you see here, prototype, rules, components, all that stuff, stuff could change. There'll be a link to the Kickstarter down below as well, so you can check that out. But all stuff, this is all prototype. Factor that in, rules, components, and all that. As far as what I like, as far as ease of play, starting off with ease of play, the game is incredibly easy to table. The rule book is, is incredibly short. It's like four pages, all very clear, very easy to read. It's a very, very easy game to understand and table. Game length does vary a bit depending on who you're playing with and what player counts and how AP prone you are. I find a good for this game is probably the hour range, but I have had a game that went closer to the two hour range with a very slow player, but it can definitely AP crawl a bit if people are taking their time with it. As far as play count, this is a two to four player game. I play this at all player counts. I've played at two, three, and four players. Four is my least favorite player count, although with a trade-off. I kind of like having the whole board on the table, both visually and just giving you more neighborhoods and as many different things on the boards. You can really specialize in a neighborhood type if you have all four neighborhoods on the board. At the same time, the fourth player adds a little extra downtime to the game without improving the experience. Three players is a nice sweet spot in terms of being able to have a short enough gap between turns that you kind of plan around, I'm going to go here, it's going to come back to me. You can start planning a little pathways. Four loses that control. Two gives you a lot of control. A lot of control of I go here, you go there, and a lot less screwage of, well, the other player screwed up my plan. Two is a direct head-to-head -head uh, battle of wits. Works very well. All three player counts worked well for me. I would say three is my favorite, then two, then four, but all of them are solid. As far as what I like, don't like, and can see others not liking. First of all, Auction bidding in general works very nicely over here. The fact that you're bidding and outbidding, but you're not bidding on the thing you're outbidding is a very interesting mechanism that I haven't seen done very often. And it's a mechanism that's very fascinating because of what happens. I could outbid you to stop you getting the thing you want, but I may not want the thing I'm going to outbid you for, which leads to an interesting puzzle as far as positioning people in bad situations. I will specifically put my 72 over here, knowing full well that this thing is worth 72, but you, what you'll have to outbid me on is not. It's a very interesting puzzle that completely changes the way you typically approach an auction bidding game, and the combination of that with the way you're building out your neighborhoods is very satisfying. That aspect I mentioned is how you slowly place buildings on the board. You're going to create little ends where people are going to have to consider how they bid. If you start a bid over here, 
it could go this way across the bridge, but it also could go to the left over here, in which case you're going to end up in a little neighborhood over there where someone's going to be able to place something. You can ramp up the bidding, force them to place high. The problem is if they actually win the bid very well over here, they can immediately place their 13 out on this center dead zone, immediately claiming it because nobody could outbid them. You'll create little traps of neighborhoods that are very satisfying to build and very satisfying to watch the payoff of them as you create this little puzzle while being mindful of your own scoring cards, the general scoring cards, how your, your little tableau is building up and the points you're going for there and the colors you're going for there. Are you going for a chunk of extra points? Or are you just going for actually just getting the right neighborhoods and building up the point values there? There's an opportunity for cascading plays, for satisfying plays in Skyrise that is very simple, very engaging, and very rewarding when they pay off. And that variable scoring aspect, the way you have multiple different scoring balances going on that you're trying to be mindful of, also adds that puzzle. And then the wonders on top of everything. The wonders, there's going to be 20 wonders here. Again, prototype, I have no clue what the final game looks like. I'm just commenting what I have over here. But the wonders are incredibly satisfying in the way they just completely add ways to get points, add ways to place your wonder. Your wonder represents a final cap. When you place your wonder down, no one can outbid it. That's once per game in the second half of the game where you're locked in. No one can outbid a wonder. When you use it, how you use it, the points you get or the benefit or the situation you get from this as you do so are all incredibly rewarding. The wonders are a lot of fun, adding both variability to the experience and just fun little puzzles as, as you try to combine with everything else to maximize your scoring, to lock in that positioning on the island, to get that extra across the bridge placement that happens to be next to a windmill, so you're going to double up on points. Are there any actual across the bridges next to windmills? I don't think there are. They actually made sure to not do that, so good on them for that. But you have a lot of different ways to go ahead and try to min-max on this puzzle using a very unique auction mechanism combined with a very simple and approachable game offering you a good overall combination of strategy and lack, I would say, lack of complexity without the lack of depth. As far as what I don't like, the scoring and the wonders are nice as far as modifying the experience, meaning you have different scoring objectives, you have different wonders, those all change the experience, but the core gameplay loop does feel fairly samey game to game. This is the kind of game that if you are someone like myself who likes variability in games, I could see this getting old if I play it too often too quickly. I like what Roxley has done to Metropolis. I played Metropolis back in the day. This is definitely an improvement on that, although to be fair, it's been like eight years, so take what I'm saying with a grain of salt there. But I like what Roxley has done with this game, and I like the additions to the game. I like the wonders. I like the scoring. I like all the things I'm trying to be mindful of. I like the general everything here. But it is an experience that can get samey if you play it too much. And so that's one thing I would say that I almost want more variability. I don't, I don't know how that plays out, and also I'm tend to be someone who likes a lot of variability in my games. Uh, secondly, I'll say that shooting the moon as a concept is an interesting concept, but I'm not totally sure how I feel about it. Uh, I, I've played this game a bunch now, and I've yet to really try fishing in the moon. The punishment or payoff on doing so doesn't seem to be worth it. If you made the points more, maybe I'd go for it a bit more. And again, I'm saying this with the, the aspect of I could be completely wrong, and it could be I'd play against somebody who knows how to play this game better than I do, and they'd completely destroy me by shooting the moon, by gathering seven, eight green tokens and completely destroying me. Uh, for me, I've just found that going for six points is generally significantly better. Usually the things you're going for points in to begin with in those areas are going to be things you want to get a lot of neighborhoods in. I want to get seven white neighborhoods, and that means the extra points is going to be seven times two. That's going to be 14 points. That's tremendous. In order for the payoff to be worth it on shooting the moon, I'd have to gather three more tokens because three more tokens would lose me those 14 points, but it would get me 16 points, and I have to weigh that up against the fact that if I go somewhere else to get other tokens, those have a point value as well. Shooting the moon just mathematically doesn't seem to be worthwhile for me. It almost feels like a consolation prize for having screwed up as opposed to a strategy to pursue. I, I wish the points were a bit more stronger in that to make it worthwhile. Again, I'm saying it using some math and some logic, but I could actually be wrong in that. As far as I can see, I was not liking... First of all, and this is not relevant in a two-player game, but in a three- or four-player game, you can feel victim to turn order. You could have somebody else mess up the sequence so that you don't have a say in how things play out. Someone else builds up a neighborhood so that, congratulations, that player got two three neighborhoods because someone else screwed up. That can happen, which is why I mentioned a two-player game, while not my favorite player count, does have the benefit of feeling the most strategic, the most cutthroat, and the least victim to any sort of turn order luck. Secondly, your personal scoring goals, they may not line up with well-played options. What I mean by that is you can get to anywhere you want on the board. That's not a problem at all. What I mean by that is the idea that 
if I have green as my scoring goal and you have yellow as yours, if I have a lot of green on green, I'm doubly incentivized to go to go for those. Those can really help me get my scoring goal while building up my green scoring. And if you have no yellow on yellow, well, I just have a better position scoring goal. I have something that rewards me more for the thing I want to go for anyway. So that's a small amount of luck. Not really a factor for me, not, not really a concern, but might be worth addressing. And lastly, I would say is if you don't get a sense for how this game plays, it might feel too random. There is an interesting auction mechanism at play. I've talked about it already. I've said in the things I like, that's all good. The flip side is that if you don't get a strong sense for how this game plays, if you don't get a sense for the sequencing, for how to place down a tile, for how to look forward as far as I'll be moving here, setting something up there. If I go there, I'll be able to get two, three. I'll be able to go ahead and go rebound back there and I also get that place. There's a general sense of what you're trying to build and how you're trying to do so, which can be very, very rewarding to do so if you figure it out. But it can feel a little obtuse and random if you don't. I have had players play this game and just not feel the puzzle was satisfying. I think it's because you're not fully getting it. It's very different in its usual auction mechanism, but it, it may be a game that's not for you. As far as final thoughts on Skyrise, I really like this game. Now, I played Metropolis back in the day, which I said already, and I got rid of that game, although I'm still not sure why, because I'm pretty sure I played it when I first got into gaming and I only played games two players, and Metropolis is a game I don't remember thriving at two players. I don't know if it's me now versus then, or it's the changes Roxley has made. I don't I don't know. What I do know is I very much enjoyed this at two players. Like I said already, four was actually my least favorite, pla for, least favorite player count, although even then, two, three, and four all worked well for me. Generally, both the production as well as the gameplay changes Roxley has done here make this a very, very solid game. It's a very compelling puzzle with my biggest personal concern just being how variable is a game to game and is it something that lasts for years in my collection or is it something that I, I enjoy for a year and eventually get tired of? I, I just don't know. It's too early to tell on that front. I do like what they're doing. I do like the variability of the wonders. I do like the variability of the scoring goals. I'd love to see more variability to this engine, but across the board, Skyrise is a very solid, easy to recommend game that has a high degree of complexity with a low degree, a high degree of depth with a low degree of complexity, a solid recommendation. This was a four to five for me. Great game, highly, highly recommended, especially if you like a little bit of abstract strategy combined with a unique bidding mechanism, auction mechanism, although if you like that specific combination of things, that's, that's a very, very specific genre. I don't know what to say. But if you like those things, if it sounds compelling, it probably will be. As far as other game recommendations, first of all, Power Grid. Power Grid is one of the go-to auction games that has a very interesting auction as well as far as you're bidding for power to supply your entire board. Another interesting twist on the general pure auction mechanism. And then the estates. The estates also did something very clever as far as the way the bidding worked in the estates and what you're trying to get and how you're trying to build out the board. Both of them are very solid games that took auction mechanisms, built it a bit into a real estate element similar to Skyrise, although all three in very different implementations. Until next time, I'm Alex Radcliffe from Board Game Co. I hope you enjoyed this video, and as always, have a good one.